so if they don't want to sell, I can completely hose. If they want to sell but are relisted, I lose the listing protection, but I still have the buyer, so I'm only halfway hosed, so to speak. So if the buyer comes in with an agent, like they they already have an agent, could you get a referral fee? Or For like, the like if, yeah, like if they've already like if the if the seller is already re-signed with somebody else and the buyer comes in and says, Hey, hey I want to buy that house, like are you still hosed if they've already if they both if they have agents come already? In with a listing with an agent and they've already re-signed with Shauna, you are pretty much hosed. I mean, you can ask for a referral, but who's going to give it to you? The buyer's agent's going to go, well, no, I've, I, I, this is my client. I've been working with them for 30 weeks. And Shauna's going to say, well, no, you're, your listing expired and they relisted with me. I'm not going to pay you a referral. So in that scenario, if that buyer had an agent and they've relisted, yeah, now you're pretty much hosed on both sides. What you would hope is if that buyer comes in with an agent and the seller says, yes, we still want to sell and no, we haven't relisted. Okay, I get the listing side under the broker protection clause and that other agent gets the selling side because they brought me a buyer. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. On page one fifty three sixty three, man, I can't see the listing presentation. We are not really going to talk a lot about the listing presentation because there are multiple ways to do it. There's what they call the single step. There's the double step where you go twice. You know, you drop the paperwork off and then you come back the next day. Um, the one thing is, I will tell you is, the listing uh, appointment is almost always a scheduled event, meaning that you're going to get the call today and they're going to call you back and go, hey, I want you to list my property. And you're like, okay. Well, it's 10 o'clock. I'll be at your house. What time do you get home? 5.30? And we'll sign the documents. So between now and 5.30, you get a chance to prepare for that listing. One of the things that you will do is what we call the CMA, the Comparative Market Analysis, or the COMPS. All right? You will also get to pull the tax record, but remember, may not be truly who you talk to. I've had this happen many times before. You get a call from Bob Smith and goes, hey, I want to sell my house. Can you be here at five to list it? Yeah, I'll be right there. So I pull the tax record up and it says David Johnson. So you got to call Bob back and go, hey, Bob, who's David Johnson? And they're like, oh, yeah, we just bought this house last week. We're a flipper. We've rehabbed it. Now we're going to resell it. Well, the recording still says David Johnson because, remember, we talked about the actual human aspect of recording in Marion County. They haven't caught up with the closing last week, but this guy owns it. So you may have to go, yeah, you better bring those closing documents to closing to prove you own it. Okay. Once again, recording doesn't have anything to do with legality, and this is a situation where you may find that. Or you, you go, who's David Johnson? And they're like, well, I'm buying it on land contract, and now I want to sell it. Okay, we may need a copy of that land contract. So this planned event, this listing agreement is a planned event. It gives you time to look up the tax record. It gives you time to pull your comps. It gives you time to search the market history. How many have sold in the last six months? So this is the good thing when you go to make the presentation. So you can make it all the way to closing without the actual proof that they own the property? Well, before they would schedule it in the scenario that I gave you, 
before they would schedule it, the title company would call Bob and go, hey, we understand that you bought this property. Can you send us the title insurance policy from your closing so we can see it? And they would say, yes, I can do that. Then the title company would go, oh, okay. So we've got one going from David to Bob dated three weeks ago that hadn't made it to the, and now it's going to go from Bob to whoever. As long as they've got verifiable proof, they won't literally go to the closing day. Yeah. They okay. will intercede in the middle and go, hey, we need proof before we go further. <coughs> But that will happen, yes. Over on page 165, the listing contract, want to talk a little bit about the contract itself, not so much the present, the, the process, because like I said, some people use the hard sell, which is the one time. You go and you make them sign it. Some people use the soft sell, where they go and do, oh, I'll leave you the paperwork, let you look it over, I'll come back tomorrow, then we can sign it. That's called the, the two-step process. Just depends on your method and style. But in the contract itself, there are certain paragraphs that we want to discuss. So in the listing agreement, this is the employment contract between the seller and who? Me. All right, so it is an employment contract. And that contract is going to do several different things. So you're going to name all of the parties that are part of the sale. Now, remember, well, I just had this discussion the other night with a client in Virginia. Husbands and wives must both sign this, even if they are not on the deed or the note. Under tenants by the entirety, the spouse has an interest in the property and they will, under Indiana law, have to sign away their rights. And signing away their rights means they've also signed the listing agreement and they will sign the purchase agreement. Okay, so you've got to capture both names if they're married. You're going to have the brokerage firm's name. This is where it's going to say the modulin group. Because remember, it's me and my company, not you. You might have a description of the premises. This is your Northwest Quadrant by the Northwest Quadrant. All right. On page 168 of this book is a sample listing agreement. Who cares? Just blow right through that. It's not even close to ours, by the way. Over on page 172, we're going to pick it up. The listing price gets captured inside of the listing agreement. But here's the key. You guys need to understand this is not your listing price. Don't ever get caught up in writing the listing price for your client. When you pull the CMA or the comps, you literally will have a range of values. You will go to your client and go, hey, look, the value of your home is between 144 and 149. Where would you like to list the property? And they're going to say what? 180. No, maybe you missed the point. <laughs> 144, 149. And they're going to say, well, I don't know. What do you think? Well, I think we should put a number between 144 and 149. Oh, okay. That's good. Good. So uh, what number are you going to write in? Well, I'm going to write a number in between 144 and 149. And just keep playing that game until they go, uh, 147? Great. Favorite number. That's the one I was going to write. Because here's what's going to happen. You say 144 and it sells in two days, what are they going to tell you? You didn't sell it for enough money. You didn't take care of me. Remember care? You have to use 
uh, reasonable skill and care to make sure your person didn't get harmed. Or it could be the other way. You write 149 and it never sells. They're going to call you up and go, hey, I wanted 144. You wrote 149. What's the name of your errors and omissions insurance company? Because we're going to sue. So don't ever write that number in on your own. Just keep playing the game with them between 144 and 149. All right. So that way, if they get 147 and something happens, you go, dude, that's your number, not mine. I tried to tell you, and this will happen. You're going to go between 144 and 149. Well, Susie sold her house down the street. And I'm a much better housekeeper, which I literally have heard. So I want to go at 154. You now have a decision to make. Do you want to list it at 154 above what you think the value is or walk away? You cannot come back to the office and go, well, my seller's crazy. I'm going to go ahead and write 147 in anyway. Lord, don't do, ever do that. So you either take the 154 or walk away from the listing and go, I can't sell it for 154, so I'm not going to be a party to this. Now, there's a lot of misconception out there where a lot of you are going to say in your head, well, if I take the 154 listing, at least I get my sign in the yard. How many of you thought about that in your head already? Eh, nobody's going to fess up to it. So here's the problem. When you go out to dinner and you have a bad meal, who do you typically yell at? The waitress, who had absolutely nothing to do with the cooking of that bad meal. So when somebody drives by a house for six months and sees your yard sign in it, what are they going to say? Well, that agent can't sell shit. No, it was the buyer seller who wouldn't listen, but the agent went, well, I get a sign in the yard. I'll go ahead and take the listing. You could potentially harm yourself and my company both because people drive by all the time and go, that house has been for sale for six months. That agent doesn't know what he's doing. So think about that when they say 154 and you have to decide, shall I take it or shall I walk away? Part of it may lean you towards, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and walk away from this.